Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big, big shit. Check it, check it, check it. This is Unique Hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing, you know, my dad. Well, go on. I want y'all to stop what you're doing right, right now. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. I mean, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, we're on it. But especially if you want to see our full-length interviews, go check out our Patreon channel. Subscribe to that, follow that, sign up for our membership, and on our YouTube membership. Because you know he likes to be chopping up these interviews. Yeah, yeah, and if y'all don't like doing that and you wanted to see the full length interviews he posts that first so let's go sign up for a membership package and you see it right off the bat man hey man we got a very very special guest for y'all today man this guy don't need no introduction mm -hmm. man i heard legend when i went he's a big guy you know he's mm -hmm. one of those guys man you remember who was in the elevator i'm like mm -hmm. oh, in the, you know this guy jay Moore? yeah he's a he's a big guy i say what He's like, yeah, I do real estate, but not like him, man. Check it out, man. Jay Morrison's in the building, man. Welcome hey, to Boss peace, Talk family. 101, peace, man. Boss Talk family. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's just so ha I'm, I'm happy to have you on the set, man. When I look at you and look at all the things that you've had to deal with, man, the challenges and the trial, you look like you haven't even been hit at all. You know what I'm saying? That's that grace. <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I talked to my spiritual mentor, peace family, peace, 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 <laughs> peace. I talked to my spiritual mentor today, and he was like, man, I watch your videos, I see you. He's like, even if I didn't know you, he said, if I, if I, if I didn't know you, I'd be like, man, I like his spirit. Yeah. He was like, you got the, you got a, you got the glow on you, I got joy on me. Bro, listen, when I came over there and, and, and shook your hand last night, I had no problem doing that because I knew your, your, I knew where your heart's at. I hear you talk. And, and that's the main thing, you know, people can say whatever they want to say, but it's the heart, man. You know what I'm saying? God God looks at the heart, bro. And I, the, I'm so glad. That's the biggest judge for all of us. A lot of times we get caught up into like uh, how much money we made or how many followers we have. But when you get to judgment day, when you get to like a spiritual reckoning, like God not looking at like how big was your platform? Mm -hmm. How many Louis did you have? How, how much assets did you acquire? You looking at your heart and how you dealt with people least amongst us. Wow. I want to go into your background. We got to get sure. more in detail. Ms. Jamaica, help me out, babe. Let, let, let's figure out who this is. Who is Jay Morrison? Man? Yes, sir. So, um, you weren't born and raised here? No. Where were you born and raised? New Jersey. New Jersey? I've been here about six years, seven years. Really? Yeah, so Somerville, New what, Jersey. What part? Sunfield? Somerville. Somerville. Okay, yeah. I saw that. We heard that. Because when we went up to interview Ice-T, I think we ran across Somerville or I saw that somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, well, tell me about Somerville. What is it like growing up in Somerville? So Somerville was a baby town of Newark, New Jersey. It was mm -hmm. a small suburban town, but we lived on the south side. Okay. And I lived on South. Uh, I lived on uh, South Side Avenue and um, Second Street and Center Street, which was like the block. Mm. And um, so now I grew up uh, in poverty, uh, welfare, free lunch in schools. My mom was 17 when she had me. Mm. She literally got off the abortion table to have me. Really? Yeah. She went to get you aborted? She was on the table. On the table? Yeah, the doctor came out like five times. And she was like, something told her like, um, don't do it. Uh, he's going to impact nations. So where was the father during this time? Did he even know that she was about to do this? My father, uh, they were friends. And... I think he like he left three months after I was born, so they weren't like in an official relationship. I know, but at the moment when she was, how how far along was she when she was trying to abort you? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, I'm not, because I'm not sure if I any months, but I mean, my grandfather, my grandmother took her there. I mean, she was a teenager. Oh, oh, so they took her because although she's a teenager, it just depends on where you go because some teenagers. It's 1980 though. Oh, okay, so you, you had to have. You can't apply by today's law. <laughs> I know. You this know, is 1980. Because you had those bootleg doctors or yeah, whatever. Nah, this is 1980. So that's like, yo, my teenage daughter just got pregnant. Like. So, so they wanted her to also have an abortion. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, they brought her there too after the abortion. She she wanted a child. And how old was your dad at that time? She was I think seventeen. He was like twenty-two. Oh. Twenty-one, twenty-two, somewhere in there. Mm. Because I know that sometimes when women are faced with these situations, it goes to a point where they take matters into their own hands and not actually inform the father, or the father says something to piss them off, whatever. Like I'm going to abort this child. So that's why I was asking. You know, yeah. did he even know that she was planning to do this? Uh, yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I'm gonna ask my get back to the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I do know is that. My mom said, um, it's a funny story. My uncle, her older brother, used to pick on her all the time. Mm -hmm. Called my mom ugly. Mm -hmm. right? He used to like, tease her. So she was like, you know what? I'm going to get with the most handsome guy I can find. I'm going to have me a son. 
And she literally found my dad, light skinned dude, six <laughs> two, handsome, like me. That's <laughs> how I man. And she was like, yo, he gonna have my baby. Mm. And she literally they did what they did. But he left three you said three months after or five months after? Three you, months. Three, three months, months after. after. I was born, yeah. Um was he in your life no. growing up? So he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Interesting story. Okay. First time seeing him, I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. She introduced me to him during a Memorial Day parade, like yeah. everybody comes to town. Memorial yeah. Day parade. She said, that's your dad right there. I'm wow. Like, that's my dad. I'm like, oh, snap. I came over to him. You know, he adapted me or something, hugged me, bought me an orange sun kiss. I remember. You remember? Orange sun kiss soda. I'm like, yeah, my dad just bought me a soda. That's like, big. Big. And um, uh, story de-escalates, though, um, in, in, in energy. So we leave, we go to Plainfield, New Jersey, and my mom said to me, we were in a, uh, in a car, she was like, don't tell your stepfather you've seen your father today, right? Because she was dating my yeah, stepfather. Yeah. He came into my life after that three months, my other stepfather okay. who came in. He was a gangster, street dude, like 13 years in prison. You know, he was, yeah. he was, mm -hmm. out, he was outside. And so the first thing I did, go as home soon and tell as I him. seen him, daddy, guess what, I met my other dad. No. Whoa. You tattletale. Yeah. He was young though. He I was know. excited. That's why. Right. Yeah. So um, they told me to wait in the car, and uh, she came back out. She had black eyes, bloody lips. Mm. Damn. Yeah, yeah, she went through it. So, Man, like, like, so when you that. saw that, did you know that that was the reason why that yeah. happened? Did she asked me? So she's like, "Why? Why did you say something? Well, how did you? How did that affect you, though?" Uh, I mean, I already was born with a high level of empathy and compassion, but. Uh, now I was hurt. I mean, I was hurt that I see that, you know, that, that decision hurt her. And I think that was like the start to me building up a lot of uh, the walls that I had earlier in my adolescence and throughout my 20s, the yeah. walls and the yeah. anger and, the, yeah. and then those kind of things. Cause I seen a lot of that growing up. Mm. So I seen a lot of things I couldn't change, but it also is what, um, it's what um, made me, these are all the elements that made me me. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so I've seen that, I've seen us, um, I remember like same thing, playing for New Jersey, uh, we had no cable, like just a TV that was just plugged up, right? And I had no video games, we had yeah. no money, like really, you know, below the poverty line. And I would turn on a TV to the staticky station. Mm -hmm, and I would mm -hmm, pretend mm -hmm. I'm playing video games with the black and white dots on the TV. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, I just grew up in a different kind of way, but I appreciate my testimony and my journey because I've been through so much and we'd be here probably all night talking about what But you appreciate <laughs> it now, but but I always like back then as a child we didn't understand understand certain things. All you were doing was I'm angry because whether my father wasn't here or angry because of what my stepfather also did. Also was driven though. Even as a child. Yeah, like I literally made a promise to myself. I literally I wasn't even in first grade yet. Uh, so we had moved from Somerville to Plainfield, New Jersey, and um I forgot what they're called. They're the kind of flowers. They yeah. uh when the petals break, they're like white. And they yeah, I like them. You can blow them and then they yeah, go everywhere. Yeah, yeah. People to catch them. Yeah, yeah, we used to play with them as yeah, kids. So I remember, I, yeah, I was chasing one across the street, chasing it down, because you could grab a yeah. wish. Mm -hmm. And I literally, I remember I wish I ran to this abandoned lot. It's like literally a go. typical abandoned lot. Broken mm -hmm. concrete, glasses, you know what I'm saying? Broken bottles, all of that. So I'm running through the lot, grabbing it. This is on 6th Street, playing for New Jersey. And I was like, I wish for a million trillion dollars. Like, yo, I'm going to be rich. Like, this is like, I, I literally understood what poverty was early. Wow. And I had made it in my mind early, like this, like. That's big though. Like, it's over, like, it's not like, I, I already knew. Yeah. I already, already knew that, that this wasn't gonna be my, my life. And and a lot of people say, well, because you were raised in it, you didn't know any better, so it was the, it was their norm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So some people accept I hated it. the embarrassment. I hated the hand-me-down clothes. I hated the brown corduroys. I hated the Google clothes for Christmas. I hated not having what everybody else had. I hated having the fake Tims. Everybody had the real Tims. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I despised it. How many um, siblings do you have? Uh, I'm the oldest of four. Of four. So, and then we had then we had brought in one of my cousins whose mom passed. So it was literally uh, seven of us in a two-bedroom apartment. Mm. Okay. And, and yeah, so like for me, just the way I'm programmed, I just internalize things, and those things also built layers of passion yeah. and ambition in me, and resolve. It was just like, all right, I like this. Just ain't gonna be me. Mm. Wow, I knew that. That was it. So I'm, did you go ahead? Go, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna ask him, like, like as you got older in your teenage years, like, was there any jobs, anything that you went out and, and aspired to do as a teenager? Because that's a long stretch for a kid when you start hitting twelve to, you know, seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, I think some of the first things that, um, so one, I come up with a family of drug dealers. Yeah, yeah. So my mom was a drug dealer. 
Okay. My step-pops was, my biological pops was, my grandfather was, my uncle was, my but aunts were. Crack era. Yeah, crack era. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, so, um, I my first time trying to sell weed was in sixth grade. Okay. And I started my own gang in sixth grade called OWE, On Worst Enemy. Mm. Really? Yeah. That's big. I went, well, well, and now I, you was in Jersey. I was in Jersey. My guidance counselor was like, man, you got so much potential. You're so bright, so well-spoken, you're so smart, man. Like, why do you keep getting in trouble? You're your own worst enemy. So I left the guidance council. I was like, I'm starting on start my own game, OWE. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, even before that, though, in fifth grade, my mom had moved from Plainfield, New Jersey, to Bridgewater, New Jersey, okay. which is a blue-collar, mm. blue-ribbon school, white suburb. But they had built an affordable housing complex okay. where all the black folks were. So we lived in this affordable housing circle. It's called Schindler Terrace. And it was all the black poor folks yeah, yeah. In, this, in this middle class town. But we went to a good school though. Mm -hmm. So I was like the only black guy in my grade in my school. So in fifth grade, I would charge the white kids at lunchtime to teach them how to dance and how to dress. I called it Cool Kids Class. So my, one of my first businesses was Cool Kids Class. I would, yeah. I would charge at lunchtime for, for the swag. Prior to that, fourth grade, I had found some broken marbles in the garbage can of our apartment complex. And it was just a bunch of marbles. So I grabbed them, went, took them to school, and everybody wanted them. So I started selling them. Selling them marbles. Ten so, the so during that time, you stopped with the drugs? No, no, I wasn't. No, he, he was young. He was younger during that time. Fourth, 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 fourth grade. Okay. Yeah, this is earlier. So this is before. Before I even get into that. I tried that. So this is working my way up. Oh, okay. But um, what I learned, though, when I was selling the marbles is... Um, I had probably like a few dozen of them, but as I got down to my last 10, my last single digits, people still wanted them. So they went from like five and 10 and 25 cents to a dollar a piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I learned supply supply and demand yeah, early. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I just like, all these principles just taught me things. So anyway, I, I tried drugs in sixth grade, selling drugs. It was like, probably didn't, it was no chance. Like, it was like, it don't even count really, but mm -hmm. I did try. And then sophomore year, I tried again. So basketball, was going to be my way out. My okay. Uncle, my uncle's name is Eric Murdoch. He played in the NBA. Okay. My cousin. What team did he play for? Milwaukee Bucks. Okay. Let's for, go. Uh, the Jersey, the Jersey Nets for a little bit, mm -hmm. and then um, my cousins, uh, Lance and Davy Miller, they went to Scotland, went to Villanova, and like most of my family, my a lot of my family played sports and was successful, so that was like reasonable for me to be successful in sports. So that was going to be my thing. I, I knew I was going to the NBA like my uncle. Yeah, definitely. And um, I was pretty nice too. Um, then as my sophomore year approached. Uh, and I didn't get no love in school from the girls so I was like you know one I went to a mostly white school so I was the only black dude so I wasn't mm -hmm. getting that much love from the white girls and only, only a few black girls and it was like I was a poor kid you know yeah. what I'm saying yeah yeah, like, yeah yeah I get it you know, right? I got the free lunch in schools I'm going to like this grocery store with the paper food stamps trying to hide them yeah you know yeah I, I just so, talked about them earlier today yeah. the paper food stamps the brown ones the, brown ones, the dollar yeah, 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 the, you know the you orange, get the dollar most the of the time yeah exactly you know what I'm saying you get the dollar <laughs> right the, the, if you get a, a 10 I ain't, got, I ain't got no fresh clothes or nothing, right? So then <laughs> sophomore year, my coach had introduced me to this um, called Hoagie Hut, just like, you know, like a sub shop. And I was a dishwasher in a sub shop, and it was paying me like under the table like $4 an hour or something. Okay. But I got my first little bit of money, and I went got a little hair and bone chain. Oh, yeah, Got a little up. fresh outfit, all of that. And my sophomore year, I came to high school, I had a fresh outfit on the first day, some real Nikes, like... And the other day it was on me. I was like, yo, I was like, yo, I like this. <laughs> I'm never looking back. Yeah. So yeah, so that's um, big. Yeah, that first week I bagged the baddest girl in school, and it was Lisa. Lisa, mm -hmm. everybody wanted her. She hopped on me. I, I ain't never had that before. I'm like, yo. So you like this airbone work, right? <laughs> this, 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 this rag work, right? So uh, just kept playing ball, and then um, my coach was trying. He was trying to do right by me. He was just doing it the wrong way. He was trying to force me out of my circles with the guys I hung around, but these are my guys in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But they all were, they was getting into smoking weed, they was getting into stuff. And he's trying to get me on the right path, but I'm like, you trying to get me to hang over, hang out with all the, all the white boys and turn my back on all my guys I, I go right. home with. Yes, yes, yes. But he's like, oh, stop, sag stop, sag stop sagging your pants and why are you wearing Timberland boots? This is in the summertime. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what are you doing? Like, this, is, this doesn't make sense. Like, why are you baggy clothes? Like, you know what I mean? This is 96, 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah that's what we were doing. We it's really your culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. couldn't get that then. Right. The culture wasn't as like, now the culture's everywhere. Before, right. the culture was very isolated. It was okay. like rock music was dominating. Hip hop wasn't dominating then. No, okay. hip hop it was, was like it was only, only that and Tupac. Tupac was the one doing a lot of that and we was kind of, we was kind of riding with it. Right, right. And we were on the East Coast, so we had Wu Tang, yeah, and, and yeah, Biggie, Wu Tang, Biggie, 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 Biggie. You had yeah, all of that. I, I, you didn't have, a, but you didn't have a lot to go by. You had uh, what's the boy? 
Uh, one with go- with, uh, with with Biggie. What was it? Mob Deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mob Deep. But all that, right? So anyway, um, I ended up getting to a, a beef with my coach. I ended up, uh, and then I got uh, issues at home too. Me and my step pops was getting into it, and he ended up choking me. Mm. And I choked him back. How and old were you at this time? I was 15, 15, okay. uh, 15 16. And, um, and you know, you choked I, him back, what happened? Uh, my mom came and broke it up, and then I left, I left home. At 15? Uh, yeah, I left home. Where did you go? Um, but hold on, before you answer that part, you saw your dad at seven. Between seven and 15, you never saw him again. Saw my dad again at nine, my biological father, at nine when I was in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. And so he just pops in and out. He used for to come a day. Every, every few years. He'd come, you know, if I needed some sneakers, just in like $30 and some child support back then or whatever, um, which is crazy. I was telling my wife last night, like, the child support that my daughters get is like crazy. I was getting like $30 and I was happy about it. Yeah. Like, I'll be sending in bags and I, I might get a thank you. Like, <laughs> they don't even call unless they need some. It was wild. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But no, nah, they showed me love, though. They showed me love. But it's just like, you know, I was so appreciative for my dad to send me 30 bucks. That's me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But um, I seen him again at nine. He disappointed me. Pops, he disappointed me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was supposed to take me fishing. Mm. And I was ready to tell all my kids in my school. It was like, like classic, like, movie stuff. Like, right, yeah, I'm going right. fishing with my dad today. Like, and da-da-da. sitting down waiting, and he didn't t- turn up. He ain't come. He left town. Mm. So I seen him again when I was 17. And um, I was I was full time. And so you were living where at this time? Because you moved out at fifteen, so I yeah. don't want to jump that part. I moved out for probably about a month. And lived where? Uh, I was living at friends' basements. Okay. I was living in different like dope houses. I was living like wherever I could get a little yeah, couch, yeah. wherever I get a little couch. Okay. And so you, you went with, back. Still hitting the streets. A oh yeah. Bit. yeah. I, 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 at that point, at that point, is that's only what I was going to eat. It yeah. was like yeah, I need some chicken wings. I need some fried rice. I need some like mm-hmm. some, some pizza or cheese sticks. Like, I got to eat. What, what was you left for a month? So you went back. Yeah, home? went back home. Okay. What yeah, was you scoring when you were scoring at sixteen? I was selling crack. Yeah, you know I'm saying, but how much were you? you t- oh yeah, t- nah, I was fifties or hundred pieces or quarters or times twenties. Okay, just yeah. to flip, just to make yeah, a little money. I was getting little clips, little vials, just from my, my older cousins. Like here, here go, go you know get it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just getting, yeah, just, 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 and I ain't even know what I was doing, but I was, you know. <laughs> Bringing enough, I guess. To and, eat. and I was getting juice too. He was like, yo, y'all sell it, y'all sell it, bring all the money back, we'll keep flipping it, we'll keep flipping it. I mean, I bought y'all. So it was like one of them joints. It was like, we sold everything, we bought our big homie back all the money, he's flipping it, he might buy us a pair of Tim's or something. Yeah, see, just give us a couple dollars y'all for a little satisfied. snack. Yeah, yeah, like, nah, I wasn't satisfied. We were, ju- <laughs> we were juicing this though. You know who you are too. Which, 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 which one's my camera? Both of them. Both of them. You know who you are. I even call your name out, King. Anyway. <laughs> um, juice this. So, so he said 17, your father. 17. So I'm, I'm, at that time, um, I'm full-time dope dealer at that time. I went back to high school after dropping out. Uh, I think okay. it, was 16, it was 16 that I actually left home and dropped out. It was 16. So you wanted to go back and finish school. So I'm at the movie theater with my friends, you know, homeless and high school dropout. And I run to my uncle. And my uncle was a street dude. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yo, go back home, man. He like your mom, man. He's, he's driving me crazy. Go back home. She worried uh, about you. Yeah, so but I'm you like, couldn't stand your, your your stepdad at the time. Yeah, so then we end up talking. I mean, my my stepfather got cool because okay. he he was in the streets doing his thing too. So we just it was just that age limit where it was like, bro, you ain't gonna keep beating me. Like, yeah, yeah, you had to like, stop. Bro, like, bro, like, like, yeah. Like, you done beat me for the last nine years. Like, you ain't gonna keep beating me, fam. Right. Like, we gonna, and, you know. and so he's selling crack. I go to the. Nah, no, he was he was actually using. He was. Using, oh, he was using. Yeah, he was using heroin. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. But yeah. That, that that's that era had kind of passed. It wasn't as people was still doing it. Right now today. I they know they do. I know they do it. But I mean, they, when that crack era came, it was like it over flooded, man. man. That, 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 some people chose crack. Some, some people, people chose boy or girl. <laughs> you know, girl. Some, some, people <laughs> some people was more than the boy type. You know what I'm saying? Like, so anyway, um, we ended up talking, and he was just like, we just kicked it like two men. And he was just like, matter of fact. We went to a wedding in Milwaukee for my cousin, and uh, my uncle was there, and uh, my uncle had a joint, and he rolled up to our smoking, and my, and my pops didn't smoke, you know what I mean? He might take a, a token, you know what I mean? He liked more than that, like, you know what I mean? He had his, he had his drug of choice. Um, he passed it to my pops, and my pops took a little hit, coughing and all that, and gave it back to my uncle. My uncle was like, here, boy. I looked at my pops like, he ain't, <laughs> like say, he ain't say nothing. I'm like, so after I smoked the joint with my pops at 16, he was like, like yeah, we good. We good. We good. 
So me and my pop smoked a joint, and then he was like, look, man, I know you're out in the streets. He's like, you're gonna be hustling, and you're gonna be carrying guns. He's like, you're gonna need 10,000, that's gonna be your bail. So that was my first goal, was 10,000. 10,000. So my pops just told me, you better have 10,000 save you're gonna carry them guns. Good game. So you listen. Good game. So I listened, so I, I made my first thousand, um, it was like uh, right after I turned 17, I made my first thousand, then I turned to two quick. And then um, I went back to this uh, vocational high school called Somerset County Vocational. And I took carpentry. Okay. I didn't know I was going to be in real estate, but I took carpentry. And um, the first thing I made in the carpentry class was a safe. Mm. I made a wooden safe. So you and, could store all your money. Yeah. And I stuffed that thing up. And then about the time I was like, probably like four months into 17, I had like 10,000. And then um, I think by the, end of, by the end of my senior year, I probably had like, I probably made over 70, 80,000, probably saved probably mm. 30, 40,000. Wow. When did you hit your brick wall? Like, when did you have your issues with authorities? Oh, let me bring it back to your question. Mm. Oh, did so I, we at 17, some? I got you, I'm coming back there too. So at 17, I'm at the crib, and I get a page from my, one of my customers, and she like, rest in peace, Mona. And Damn. she like, hey, um, he's like, hey, your pop's in town. I'm like, oh, that's cool. She's like, you got something? I'm like, yeah, like, you want some? Wow. Like, or, like, what do you want? She was like, you want two? I'm like, all right, bet. Tell me I'll be down the street. So my first time seeing him since nine, I came down the street with two 20s in my hand. Wow. For him? Yeah, for my pops. Wow. Because he know you were in the streets and he know you have. No, nah, nah, this ain't nah, this ain't my step pops. No, this your, no, this I know that. Real I'm, I'm talking your so real father. So yeah, he just he was just asking because it wasn't your real was, father who told you that you have to have ten thousand. No, it was his stepfather. That was my stepfather. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. My real father was out the picture at that time. Okay. My stepfather. And so what happened was my my real father came in town from Nebraska, so mm -hmm. he was living in Nebraska my whole life. So he so how did he know that you were in the streets doing your thing? He went to his peers. He just went and to they people. told him that that's the your dude. son got the. Ah. Uh. He was like, yo, who got it? He was like, your son, he got it. So call you and call he call him. Yeah. And he didn't try to come with no words of wisdom or no none. Nah, he just gave came him, for the product. I, I, okay, two twenties. I gave him two for thirty. Usually I do 230, 2 for 35, but my pops. You give him a discount. Wow. How did you feel once you once you gave it to your pops, like distributed to your pops? Man, I honestly can't even say I have an emotion attached to that. Wasn't even Because nothing. he wasn't it was, around. It was, and I was just so into money. I had already convinced myself, well, this is like a different frequency me, right, to where I'm at today. And, you know, this is 98, and this is all a... Uh, all the culture of more money, uh, it's like uh, money over everything and all, all of that kind of culture. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, I was just desensitized to morals, really. Mm. It was like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. I, just, I was just getting to that point where like, I so cracked the aunts, uncles, it don't, it don't matter, like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm just getting money. Because you know? another person that we interviewed recently, and this is a question that a lot of people always, you know, eventually ask, is the fact that like, he was saying his mom, ever since he was eight, he used to see her, you know, walking and seeing her taking drugs and stuff like that. She was, she's been on drugs, even up to today, she's still on drugs. And this was 30 something years ago when he was, Oh, no, he's probably about 50 now. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's been on drugs a long time. But um, he said he hated the fact that people who he knew, even knew, even as a kid, would sell her drugs. But he ended up turning to the streets. And I said, so he didn't sell her drugs, but you sold other people's mother. Yeah, it's, it's also, it's drugs. How you oxymoronic. It's yeah. all like, it don't even make no sense. No, and, and, and if, you live, if you're in the streets, like I told you, and like I told him, you know, like my auntie or whoever was on it, they were slick anyway. Dope fiends be slick. They're going to come up with ways to get it. His daddy might have told somebody else and they was going to get it anyway. anyway. Yeah. They're going to get it from him, the but they're going to figure it out because they that's what they do. they they trying to figure out how to come up on yeah. that and that they'll do anything to get it. Here's the interesting part. Uh, so after that, my pops came back. He was like, yo, son, what you just gave me, I go for twice, double in Nebraska. He like, wants to go sell. He was like, well, like word? I was like, bet. So... Um, his trip was ending. I told my mom, like, I'm about to go see Pops in Nebraska. So I went, went uptown to Harlem, New York. That's where my, my, my connect was. I got two ounces of coke. And I flew from Newark Airport to Lincoln, Nebraska. With the coke with on two you. ounces of coke in my side pocket. And I, I blew a Nietzsche short to on, cargo shorts, Tim's on with a blue Yankee fitted, a white tee, and a black shoestring in my safe on my, on, on my neck, my safe key on my neck. And I flew to Nebraska like two weeks later with two ounces and uh, met with my Pops. Uh, he scooped me. He showed me how to. I didn't. I, I didn't know how to cook up then. So my pop showed me how to cook up on the stove. And um, my stepmom, his his wife at the time, uh, uh, Queen Casey. I love her. She was a gangster. She showed me how to cook up in a microwave. And um, 
<laughs> uh, I, I sold every gram of that. I ain't take no shorts. I came back with like 50, 5,600. I had 56 grams, came back at 5,600. Wow. Mm. That, and, and this, and, and you know this. Free room and board. <laughs> <laughs> so you went through the airport. No, did you even? They feel, didn't have it, dogs back then. It don't then. matter. You didn't feel no. You was like, I, I got this. I'm. This why people. Did you feel like it was an issue, bro? Oh, listen, this is why people don't understand me today. What year like, was that? This Hold on. What year? Ninety eight. I told you at seven. I said I wasn't like I'm not gonna be poor. But, but you, that, have, you gotta understand. I, I had some partners get text, caught. No, I had man. some partners get caught. So you, you talking about they can't catch you? Yeah, they, they could catch you. I'm a hustler. During so, that time, yeah, I, I ain't gonna but say their name, but, but people got caught. I promise you. That's what I'm wondering. Did they have like, dogs they, yeah. back then sniffing people back then? I mean, they could have. I, mean, I didn't experience it at that time. I'm sure they did. But also in my 17 year mind, you got to understand, came like, I came from nothing. Yeah. And I created a whole world for myself. Yeah. So he thought so, he was untouchable. But I, my first rollie was in 98. I had a blue face of Mariner Rolex in high school. But when you, okay. So I'm just thinking but of mind, when you went uh, through the airport, you just like no fear, no not even thinking about it. Like I gotta go. With no I'd, thought. I'd, I'd, already been, I'd already been to Harlem, New York, multiple times, copping, taking a subway to trains. Like, but this uh, is trains are different. I felt like God blessed me to be a drug dealer. You That's like, what I'm, you felt. Like, this is my yes. So at that time, you I'm believe in high school, God. At that like, time, okay, I make thirty five. Okay, I make thirty five hundred a week. Net profit times fifty two weeks divided by a million divided by that, I'll be a millionaire. Like bro, like I You working. Yeah. So as a kid, you knew God I, at that time? Huh? You knew God at that time? Yeah, I grew up in church. I was a youth ministry president. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So was it easy to go from being a youth ministry pre president to going back out in the street selling Man, dope, going back to being a youth I'll minister be, president? I'd be in church and my beeper go off and I go downstairs to the children's church in the nursery basement and call Joe. And I see him after church. Wow, wow, that's heavy. I'm telling I, you, I, I wouldn't go up there. <laughs> I go by and cut the music down. I was, I was real respectful. I wasn't going up there. You know what I'm saying? I was not going up there. And you didn't feel guilty at that time. You got nah, nah. I'm like, man, listen. I'm, it's I'm all watching, about business. I, I'm watching my pops go in and out of rehabs. I'm watching my mom get beat. I'm watching. I done been beat. I done been sexually abused. I done watched so much stuff go on in my yeah. life. I'm like, man, God owe me. Wow. Like, man. How old were you when you were sexually abused? I was uh, seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's basically, okay, I got to get to the, the part where you hit this brick wall because you didn't just, you it, you stopped selling drugs for a reason. Something happened. Oh, it took a long time for that. How old that? were I was, you? I was 25 when I stopped selling drugs. And why did you stop? Uh, Realizing the potential of my of my life, a picture of my gifts and my, my, my character. Like I realized that I was, at the time I was 25, uh, I was in Newark, New Jersey, selling selling dope on uh, South, South Tempest Springfield. And I had already done two and a half years in prison. Oh, you went okay, to prison, that's so what I was did. saying. You, well, how? Yeah, I was, so you, but you saying that's the brick wall. That wasn't the brick wall. That was a brick wall. No, that was school. <laughs> why, why would you go to prison? Why, what, it, you had to get caught with some drugs or something. Yeah. But he called that school. He don't call That's that a brick, brick wall. He don't call that a brick wall. Okay, when you got, you didn't feel no remorse when you went there, but it do be the homies there too, though. That's not. No, I mean, I'm saying, you know, I, what I'm saying? saying? I, I didn't want to be locked up, mm -hmm. but I'm saying I got locked up in New York. Matter of fact, um, so after I went to Nebraska, I met somebody in Baltimore. I started going down there too. So I had a drug trafficking ring from New Jersey, from New York to New Jersey, to New Jersey to Baltimore, Baltimore to Nebraska. And so I was making this route, and so I was taking another trip to Nebraska, and my. At the time, my girlfriend called me and she was like, yo, I'm pregnant. And I was in the Baltimore. She called me from Jersey, so I'm pregnant. And that's your first child? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was and like- And how old were you this time? I was 17. Okay, so you're still, okay. 17, uh, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, you know what? I'm about to stop. I was like, I already got some bread saved. I'm about to make one more flip. I'm going to Nebraska, my pop's waiting for me. I'm about to get 250 grams. I'm gonna sell all that, 100 a gram. I'm gonna make 25,000, put that mm -hmm. with the rest. I'm gonna go to a little community college and raise my, raise my, my kid. But yeah. Got it. That trip, I went to New York. It was hot outside. There's cops everywhere. But I'm like, this is me. I'm, I mean, like, invincible. I'm, I'm invincible. So I go see Pio. You know what I'm saying? We, yeah, yeah. we go. I get my bag. I'm walking. It's so many cops out. I'm talking about I'm literally these people getting locked up across the street. It's jump out boys over there. It's TNT van right there. I'm literally walking through a landmine. <laughs> 
So I'm walking so fast, I make the wrong turn off of Broadway and where Broadway connects to Riverside, if you take on 138th, it takes you down the hill instead of up the hill. Okay. So I went down the hill and my car was up the hill. Mm. So I'm like, shit, I gotta turn back around. So something, my spirit, I didn't know how to listen to it then, I wasn't obedient then, my spirit was like stash of drugs. So I took the quarter kilo out of my pocket, I wrapped it in my red do-rag, and I stuffed it in the alley. I took like three, four steps away, and I was like, the inner me was like, nah, get that shit, bro. And you turned around and went and I got it. I turned around and got the drugs. Walked around the corner again, went to my car. By the time I got to my car, my driver was like, yo, let's go, the cops just came. I was like, what happened? He said, I told him to fuck off. Oh, I'm like, bro. Excuse my language, I like trying to curse. I was like, bro, why would you do that? I'm like, come on, let's go. So when he took the engine and, and drove off, yeah, he right put the blue him. lights on. So the cops pulled up to the car. They like, everybody step out. And I had a loaded 30 handgun under the seat. And so I'm like, all right, officer, everything cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Try to break on him. Yeah. They grab my jacket, they rough me to the ground, tackle me. And so the cops on the ground, they, they, they punching me, all of that. I reach in my pocket, I got the, the, uh, the bag of coke. So I bust the bag and I'm on the ground, I'm slinging the coke everywhere. I try to throw it over a fence, hit the top of the fence. Yeah, so they can't down. really tell yeah. you how much Cops it was. Got, yo, it's like a movie. Cops got coke all on their shoulders, all on their faces, coke. Wow. So anyway, they, they charged me. Um, I took the weight because my, my driver, he wasn't a part of my ring. He was just a guy driving for me. So um, that night, I let him go. I was like, yo, everything was mine. He can go. So I took the weight for my charge. And he offered me three years of life in prison. And um, I went to Rikers Island. C-74, my three upwards, going back up off the prison, and then they downgraded my three years of life in prison to a one to three. And I pleaded guilty to that, served a year in prison, um, and it was criminal school. It just inspired me more. Like, I was seeing dudes in there who had yachts, boats, g Yeah, because you came out and went even harder. Yeah, so then I came home, I was like, I got, I got some plays in there, and I came home, and a new so connects. That connects. <laughs> That's like, connects. Wow. Came home and seen Boogie. It's like, yo. So, y'all, y'all celebrating everything when you come home. Like, yeah, you back, man. We for the kill I took, it. I took and your two child was off. born. I took two months off. I was like, yo, I ain't touching nothing for two months. I'm going to enjoy this freedom. But two months, I went right back in. Was your child born at this time? She was born while I was in prison. While you were in prison? Yeah. Did that even affect you? Yeah. That you weren't able to be there to yeah. see her being born. I'm just checking because certain things didn't affect you as a kid because your mind was just on. So I was just checking. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, no, nah, I was definitely. I wish I could have been because you know, like you know, my dad wasn't there for for me, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I just inspired, you know, inspired to do more. But for me, it was like, yo, I always took on a savior complex. It was like, I remember telling myself at 17, I was like, if I gotta go away, go away for prison for forever or whatever, if I could leave enough money behind for my family, like I'll do it. Mm. Wow, your mind would sit on that. Just that lifestyle. It was like it was just, just making like, sure that everybody we, we gonna be straight. Yeah. It was like yo, if, if I gotta if I gotta take one for all of us to be straight, then it's like. Now I really understand why when I seen you teaching about transferring your life to this to that. Now it makes sense because I really never got the detail of the story. Mm. But I just seen you on the chalkboard. I seen you on the whiteboard doing this and showing that. Like who is this guy? What is he talking about? But with your credentials, the way you just laid them out, right. I understand that 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 you would know. Like it, I, it's the same thing. And that was my first felony. I had three of them. Wow. And then I went to prison in Maryland and then prison in Jersey. And my, wow. my cellmate was How double life. How long did you stay? Um, to, total, total two and a half years between all three, oh, all, all so three was, states. You never really got like, Smart. a long yeah, stay. God was giving me grace, man. And, that, and that's what happened. So I was at 25 years old. I was like, oh, bro, like, you still selling dope. All right, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, a red, cherry red navigator at 19. I paid cash for off the lot. I had some jewelry, Cartier, this and that third. But I'm like, yo, bro, you got some, 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 you know, some street stats, but you're 25, you got three felonies, you get locked up again. Mm -hmm. Going three away, way, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, and it's like, you're still selling drugs. And now you, I'm even selling drugs worse though, because prior to me selling dope in Newark, I had sent 700 grams of Coke and five pounds of weed to Maryland. Wow. And my transporter got caught. And I thought she was gonna tell on me. And she didn't. She didn't tell. So we bailed her out and we got her a lawyer and the lawyer beat the charge. Wow. Um, for a legal search and seizure. But I'm like, yo, if she would have told that was it. Over. Bro, my it whole like, ain't no ain't we ain't interviewing right now. No, nah, not at all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ain't no Jay Morris saying none of the things. We, so 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 I switched my hustle from selling coke to selling dope. I'm like, all right, well, my coke route busted. I'm gonna start selling heroin now. <laughs> well, now I'm, I'm selling the so boy. So I get to this point where I'm approaching 25. It's 24 still. Approach 25. I'm just like, yo, this ain't looking as bright as it did. Any more kids yet at this point? Nah. Okay. 
I'm like, this ain't looking as bright as it did years ago. I believed in it. I believed in a dope game. I believed in. So yeah, 25, man. So the brick wall for me was not the consequences of something external. It was all internal. Mm -hmm. It was like, are you a drug dealer or are you a hustler? Mm -hmm. If you're a drug dealer, you only can sell drugs. Mm -hmm. If you're a hustler, you hustle anything. Mm -hmm. So when I was on, on parole in, in 2002, when I was 22, 22 years old, I was on parole, uh, a, a mentor at a Saturday men's group that I had to go to, Pastor Antoine Thomas, um, I was ready to go back to prison because I hated parole. So I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm about to turn myself back in. I'm about to go to jail because I hate this parole. I hate this curfew. Breath of life. Yeah, just go ahead and just yeah, serve this whole time and then y'all yeah, yeah. out of my life. This is, this is my bright 22-year-old idea. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going back to jail. Like, I'm just, <laughs> I don't like this. So the pastor was like, all right, bright idea. Before you do, take this business card. My wife's a, mor a processor at a mortgage company, and I want you to go apply. I'm like, I don't know about the mortgages. He's like, yo, just try. So I went to the mortgage company, and I, I applied. They accepted me on a commission basis to be a loan officer. They started teaching me about credit and how to build credit and about financing and real estate and mortgages. And um, and it was fascinating to you? It was cool, but what was fascinating is my grandmother let me refinance her house, which was just paperwork, application, boom, boom. And I made like 3000 mm -hmm. And then my aunt let me refinance her house and made 3000 It's the money that fascinates I made 6000 in like 45 days. And I was like, yo, I ain't have to do nothing for real. Like pushing papers like but most dope deals would be like even just that amount they'd be like that's not enough I need but to I'm already looking at scale though it was like alright that's just two people but I'm just like the fact that you gotta think to make 6,000 in the street at least at the level I was at then is like I gotta take a lot of risk to make mm -hmm, 6,000 mm -hmm. I gotta be standing in the sun I gotta be standing in the, in the rain and the mm -hmm. winter I gotta have a whole block running like there's a right. lot of a lot of variables here yeah. but I just made 6,000 for sliding some papers some paper, like Bro, that's easy breezy. Yeah, that's one thing I've always said, um, even way before I even met my husband, because I always knew, even back home, I knew a lot of people who did certain things. And I used to always say, if you can be out here hustling in these streets, you can turn what you, because you know how to do money really good. Most of these guys can look at money and know exactly how much, mm -hmm. just look at, you know, the thickness and be like, oh, that's such and such, that's such and such. And if you have a group of people working for you, you delegating responsibilities. All skills. There's so you handling much skills. with inventory. You handling with exactly. transport. You handling with I'm accounting. Like, if you can do all of that, why wouldn't you turn around and be an entrepreneur running your own business where you're not looking over your shoulder? Exposure and belief in self. See, I had the exposure part handled because someone introduced me in a mentorship program mm -hmm. to real estate. But I still hadn't believed that I was bigger than a block. Mm. And so at 25, I challenged myself. Like, yo, if you're really the man, like, bro, if you're really the man, you should be there going real estate and be able to do the same thing. I'm like, yeah. I'm you can flip anything. Any, anybody who is in the streets can flip anything. You got to apply yourself and you got to learn that new industry. Right. That's the part that we don't want to yeah, do, yeah, right? Yeah. You can't talk and dress the same way and not understand the lingo of real estate. You got to mm -hmm. understand what an ROI is, what an LTV is, what an ARV is, right? What a loan origination is and equity and appreciation and you know what I'm saying? So um, I just challenged myself. So I didn't get caught or nothing like that. I literally quit one day. Wow. That day I quit. I was and like, man. Because you had another job, which was real estate. Yeah, no, I didn't even have the job then. I was going to go get the license and the go license. do it. Okay. I just knew that, I just felt like my time had expired. And mm -hmm. it's like, either I'm gonna expire it or it's gonna expire me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, I don't, I had a, had a, had a, had a, a vision. And the vision was me in jail with a tan suit on with these green bars and the paint was chipped on the bars and I was behind the bars. And another vision, I was on a curb Black black concrete and a tan curb, and my head was bleeding. I was on the ground, so I shot me. Did you have a girl at this time? A oh, girlfriend? Yeah. Oh, I had a bunch of them. Oh, no, the reason why I was asking. <laughs> that's the, real. The reason and, why, and, 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 and that's or, or you said a bunch of them, but the main one. You know, men usually have yeah. a bunch of them, but yeah. the main one is who I'm talking about. Yeah. Because um, most times, like in the movie Power, like whenever a guy trying to leave, to, out of the game whatever the girl loved the lifestyle sometimes they'll be like no you gotta stay you gotta stay cause you gotta keep that money coming did you have that problem? nah some almost so I have found a new girl who wasn't hip to my old life and I was transitioning to my new life with her oh okay she was a teacher she was a Hampton U grad all of that like you know what I'm saying and so I was transforming with her but then the girls I was rocking in the street and even the one that had caught the charge for me, they like, yo, what? Like, what exactly. do you mean? Like, exactly. You know, so actually I got, a, I, I, I got, I got, I ain't gonna talk about it, but <laughs> there's, 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 some, there's some things coming around over that. What? But, um, 
But yeah, so yeah, anyway, I segued in and I put my head down and I just went knee deep into learning real estate from scratch. Like, did uh, you have a mentor, somebody that really helped you to grow and scale fast or did you just study nah, the craft yeah, yourself? Nah, I, I, had, I had a few mentors. Um, John Wenzel was one. I used to call my white dad. He's a white guy um, in New Jersey who knew I was a felon, knew I was off the streets, but he took me to his mortgage company. I literally helped him put the tables and chairs together with a screwdriver, helped build his office out. And he taught me from, from scratch, from the ground up. Like, uh, he taught me about 1003s and loan applications and just the whole, I just asked, just, he just gave me the game. And, but I, I also was getting up every morning at seven, getting to work early before nine. I was staying late with him, doing like 12, 14 hour days. I was just soaking it up. I was just listening, I was just trying. Um, I only made 2,500 my first nine months. And he used to just even cut me checks sometimes, which I was trying so hard. He was That's like, big. He would just front me like, yo, just take care of me. You know, one day I'll give you a draw, here you go. And um, I was borrowing money from my mom. So I, I, I some money saved up from the streets, but then I, I blew it. I just, I just spent it all just living. And um, so I was borrowing money from my mom. I bought two houses. I bought, I bought two duplexes. Actually, no. I bought two duplexes for, as a landlord. I flipped the house. And then I bought a house under my, under my name for my mom. So I understood financing. I was going through the motion, but I wasn't making no money, though. I had houses. I had no money. Wow. I had, I, had a, I, had a, I had a duplex of four acres of land, but I had no money. And I started borrowing money from my mom. Then I was like, you know what, man? This ain't working out. So I started calling back my old people. Like, yo, what's, what's prices right now? Like, what's going on? And the month that I was going to go back to the streets, um, uh, I closed like seven deals or something like that, six deals. I made 13000 And then the next month, I made 30000 And then four months later, I made 93000 What was the book that you read that impacted you during that time? University of Success by Og Mandino. Good book. Amazing book. I bought 36 of them for my family. Wow. For Christmas. What, what's, so, what's so big about this book? It's a collage of the best motivational speakers and leaders in history. So each chapter is different. And it just really breaks down the different soft skills that you need to be successful, really building your self-development. You know what I mean? So it's like once you start believing in yourself, the rest take care of itself, honestly. And it was it was talking about also just even our, our duty under God and how it wasn't really a spiritual book, but it just helped round me out in regards to just um, having a self confidence, uh, also having like the skills of understanding how to use my time and potential and things like burning your own. So stories like there was an army captain who went to a ship with his with his with his crew with his, with his I troops. Got this. I, I yeah. know that story. Yeah, and he got off the boat. That's and right. Like, all right, Captain, where are we going to go? He's like, everybody burn the boats. Burn the like, boats. I burn the boats. Yeah. I'm going to get home. He's like, well, live or die on this island. That's right. And it was a big army that they was going to fight. Right, correct. That's big. You know what I'm saying? I love like, that. Stories like that. And it was just like, that's how I felt. It was like, I just burnt the boats. Like, yo, I, I literally had drugs when I, when, I, when I left the streets. I still had like two ounces of coke left. I had some heroin left. I gave it all away. Wow. I ain't trying to sell it, make no money. I, I just knew in my spirit, like, yo, this is time to go. Like, it's wow. time to go, fam. I broke my crack phone, broke my trap phone, like, and, and, and dove into it. So then, Less than a year later, I had uh, maybe up to a year and some change. I mean, like a hundred, so I had like a hundred thousand, hundred twelve thousand in the bank, cash, legal. And I was like, oh, this that's is crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've been yo, there. I'm like calling my boy, like, yo, bro, I got a hundred in the bank, cash. And, and, and I, I can show them folks. I got, yeah. I got, like this legal. I, I was tweaking. I was tripping. Man. And then next thing you know, like within the next two years, I made my first million. Let me ask you this, man, because you've been on the internet crazy. Uh, I seen it back and forth with with you and certain people. I, I know that you ain't been saying the names of the people that you was into it with. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it don't benefit me. It don't benefit <laughs> you. But at the end of the day, my name's a valuable one. <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 my you name's get, a big bet. You get into it with this guy like, and and you you sue him is what I'm what I'm uh, seeing in the internet. Like, uh, how much did this um, basically? build you in a sense from where you were to where you are now like for going through that situation I would not be who I am today and where I'm at today had I not had that trial period that affliction period that persecution period yeah that was just another storm another test it's like what you made of and yeah. what 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 uh what's so vindicating about it for me is like what God shared with me at the end of the whole thing is like, see, I'm not a, I'm an influencer, but I'm not an influencer. Yeah, I'm a real estate guy, but I'm not a real estate guy. Like, I'm a man of God. I'm called by God to do great things 
and just whatever it is he got for me, right? So I went through all these. I didn't even get to half my stories, but God, I've, I've been divorced. I've been bankrupt. I've been like all these different things, right? Parole, work release, house monitoring, ankle bracelet. I got the, the, the cliche black man's journey yeah. of everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And God specifically gave me that testimony so I could minister and reach so many people on a real level. So like even going through a social media slander or whatever the case is, God just said to me simply, if you can't handle social media, you can't handle nations. That's real. I thought about you when I was looking at that stuff, and I thought about Joseph in the Bible, mm -hmm. how he never complained, but he kept going through trials. Whether he was, he knew he was a king, but once he gets thrown in the pit, brothers turn their back on him. He ends up having to go into Egypt, and when, once he gets there, he go, ends up going to jail and all kind of stuff. He's just going through all these different things, but he don't complain, and he consistently go through what he got to get to in order to help a lot of people. Yeah, same thing you just ended your conversation with. So it's like I'm, I'm I feel amazing, like I'm because everybody know I'm tested and I'm vetted. Mm -hmm. Like everybody know. It's just crazy though that the way that you know how your wife and. Like my wife, when we went through our situation, it, we never shook because we knew God. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? No matter what nobody throw at us, we still praying together. Me and the kids, my wife, yeah. we reading together. We, we, we standing firm together. So it's hard to come up against somebody when they know God is the one backing mm -hmm. them. So that was one of the main things that I had going for me. And when you a man of God like that and the priest of your household like that, you got to understand that you're not even going against that person, man. It's just a spiritual Come warfare. Come on now. Do it's I say that a lot? <laughs> it's real. It's just a spiritual warfare. Like the same people, like if the if the internet had any level of spiritual maturity, spiritual ranking, yeah. I'd be able to see that the man attacking you, does he pray with his family? Mm hmm I'd be able to see your heart. Because like look at this, if you're a man of God, I'm a man of God. We can't argue with him for so long. That's mm -hmm. it. Because if you're a man of God, I'm a man of God, then I'm gonna treat you like I want to be treated. So even if you offend me, I'm gonna follow the word of God. If your brother offends you, go to your brother first. That's right. Go to your brother directly. That's right. If a brother be overtaken in a fault. Or, Not through social media. Or if you offend me and dog me as a man of God and all that, then one of us would be quick to go to compassion, quick to go to forgiveness, yeah, yeah. quick to go to understanding, quick to go to prayer. So it's like, you comparing me to a non-man of God, like, bro, it's the comps ain't there. In real estate, we have something called comps. It's three comparable homes that are similar in square footage, similar in style, similar in age, similar in bedroom count, bathroom count. That gives you the, the value, the average price of a three comparable homes that sold within one square mile within the last six months. That mm -hmm. gives you the value of a home. Mm -hmm. Y'all comparing mansions to trailer parks. Mm. Wow. These, you, the only cops for me are other men of God. Mm -hmm. That's real. Other real men. That gotta mm -hmm. be. So you, the, the cops ain't the same. So yeah, it, it, it looks funny, it looks off. Yeah, you comparing like, you know. Let me ask you this, Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Mm -hmm. Explain that to me, what, 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 are we, what, what, are, what is it? Tulsa what? Real Estate Fund is um, a regulation tier two crowd fund. Okay. It's the largest black owned crowd fund in the history of America. Wow. We uh, partnered with 15,000 families from 22 countries and were able to raise uh, over $11.5 million together to deploy $9.4 million into projects in uh, 10 different states with 12 different uh, developers, black de all black developers from around the country. We've created over 200 jobs. Uh, we built a black house here in Atlanta. You got to see it before y'all leave. It's right in East Point by the airport. It is. The Legacy Center, yes. A 30,000 square foot, uh, culturally dipped Class A events venue and media production space. Um, we've also launched a mentorship program, Big Brothers Anonymous, which through our through our center, which partnered with the Obama Foundation. We mentor oh. young uh, men of color, young boys and men of color, ages 12, 24. Only here in Atlanta? Only here in Atlanta for now. And uh, but the, the Trouble's Fund is group economics. It's Black Wall Street in real life. It's Black excellence in real life. It's, wow. it's, 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 um, it was our duty to carry on Marcus Garvey's vision, Honorable Elijah Muhammad's vision, Malcolm X's vision, Dr. King's economic vision, and so many others. Um, O.W. Gurley, the founder of Black Wall Street, and J.B. Stafford of Tulsa, Oklahoma, were called Tulsa Real Estate Fund, not because I'm from Tulsa, but because the homage. That's, to Black it. Wall that's Street. it, that's yeah. it, that's it. And so, um, 
Yeah, it's it's, it's exciting. Uh, it's polarizing. Yeah. Um, but it is a fund that went through an SEC investigation, an FBI investigation, DOJ investigation, eighteen month investigation, hundreds of thousands. So of they checked employees. everything. They checked everything. No findings. Wow, that's huge. And it's helping so, so many people. Yeah. So I got a question because whenever I looked you up on um, YouTube or anything, and um, especially YouTube, why is it, uh, or break it down to me, why do I see the word scam? Because you can get more views if you put scam next to my name. That's it. Yeah, no, yeah. but because, you know, in order for somebody to say scam or that somebody's a scam artist or whatever, it has to be something that transpired that a person might get offended as much as mm-hmm. it's not truly scam, but something that rubbed somebody wrong or somebody felt like you deceived them. You might have said something and, you know, whatever scenario. I just right. want to know what transpired, you know, briefly on that, that why. I want to hear your side. Sure. So to well, say. I'll tell you what, since the we launched our fund June 1st of 2018. Mm-hmm. After that first week, I think we raised like $6 million in 24 hours, 48 hours. Wow. That's big. And Huge. several million the first week. And after that second week, I've been called scam since. Because you raised it that quickly? Um, no other company does that? No, uh, Nobody else does that? No one in the black community has ever in history, other than Marcus Garvey. Hmm. He raised 800000 back in 1921, equivalent to $10.5 million today. Right. And so ever since then, you can go back to the, go, you go to YouTube, go to Jan, go to do the, go to June 2018. Before we ever even bought a property, before we even hire staff, before we could do anything, they said from the beginning he's gonna moment y'all money. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam. And people ran with it because it, it was hot. We were like we were viral. So it's like mm. if I'm a antagonist, if, if my social media brand, my YouTube brand is to antagonize or to be low frequency. If somebody's over here doing high frequency black power kumbaya, having his wife getting married, you represent all his excellence, y'all stupid for doing that. Y'all gonna invest in his company, all you're gonna do is da 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 da. So then they did that so much in six months, six months into the company, the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, that's United, why they investigated United States y'all. government came and investigated us. That's why. The Federal Bureau of Investigation came and investigated us, which is part of the Department of Justice. They literally knocked on our home door. Looked at all our tax returns, because of all, all of that our bank statements, all of everything. After 18 months, mind you, I'm a three-time felon mm-hmm. going through this, and I'm an activist. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, oh, they're going to just they gonna just hang me. Run your, I didn't right. do nothing, but right. come on, it's a miracle. Right. And everybody going to say, see, we told you also. Mm-hmm. Went through all the investigations, no findings. Not a slap on the wrist, not a probation, not a nothing. You know what they said after that? What? He's still scamming. Hmm. Wow. Because it's in a day and age of social media and the way how all these records are more than likely public, you would think that somebody would come out and say, here's the paperwork. You know, cause everything goes on social media now. Here's the paperwork. Here's the proof. Here's this. And y'all still listening to him. This is what. Did really that ever doing. anything like that even ever happen? King is at sec.gov. <laughs> it's on our website, totalrealestatefund.com. Click financial reports. You can leave all our financials and the SEBC report. But don't you understand why? You you explained it. It's spiritual warfare. Yeah. It's pretty much, Fine. it's going to happen. Anytime you see anything rise up and it's successful. They call it Jesus a scam. He was healing people, bro. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, like, who am I? Who am I? That's right. That's And that's where you get your inner strength from. Yeah, they call MLK a communist. They said Malcolm was a sellout. Like, I mean, listen, I just, I'm, in, I'm in good company. Bro, I just came upstairs, up, up the elevator with him. This lady goes crazy. I tell her, this is not who you think it is. Stop tripping. It's not him. He, who she part, thought it was. He, who he was. So she <laughs> confirms it. He stops what he's doing. He's on the phone. He's busy, of course. He ends up taking pictures with her. She shots him out. But he also puts her on game on how she can learn from his his whole brand. You know, where the website is, how she can be a part of it. What is the website? And, and how long did it take you to even build up that, that whole situation for us? You know, how people can connect with you, how yeah. you can basically be a, a, a really a blessing to them. Yeah, I went viral back in like 2011, 2012. I was a celebrity realtor on NBC. I was a real estate expert on NBC's Today Show. I was working for prominent property, Sotheby's International Realty, largest luxury real estate company in the country, in the world. 
And um, I was putting some stuff out on World Star Hip Hop, and it went viral. And I was on a Breakfast Club back mm-hmm. then. Okay. And I'm glad to. Yeah. So people reached out to me, and uh, I essentially put together an online school back in like 2013, 2014, before everybody was doing it. They, they called me the pioneer, the financial literacy revolution. And, uh, and you're together, so young. Yeah. So I've educated over 500,000 students in the last 10 years. Wow. Um, made the Inc. 5000 twice, top 10 educational company in the country, top 13. Um, but yeah, the program now is continued on under the J. Marston Academy. Uh, we have a new program called Credit to Cash Flow. Mm. It's about um, how we use the bank's money in their system to buy our freedom. Because you know that um, majority of black people in the United States, and I can only talk about United States, um, of the people that I've met, it's, oh, I don't care about credit. I want to pay everything cash. Like, why use this weird. credit? Why should I get a credit card? Why should I build my credit? I don't need it. I think it's it's two different ways because Dave Ramsey does it. it. It's just he's wrong. <laughs> why Dave is Ramsey Dave Ramsey, is Ramsey is wrong. wrong? He's wrong. <laughs> give me the give me the the. Why? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna give you an example. This is my grandma's ring. My grandma Judy. She passed away, and when I was young, she told me I would inherit her ring. Okay. Right. So That's it's J that ring. ring. That's hard. If I was, I mean, you were in the elevator. If I was talking to the queen and his ring slipped off into the elevator, right? And the elevator was going down and the doors was closing. And I had to go in there, I had to get my grandma a ring, right? And risk my arm in there to get my ring. But you said, King, don't worry, I got it. And you're gonna risk your arm in the shaft to grab my grandma's ring, right? And you're gonna take the risk. I know it's risky. I'm gonna let you do it. Get it, King, go ahead. <laughs> I'd rather risk, I love you, and I don't want your wife to be with you and you got kids armless. And if you lost your arm in the elevator shaft because the door's closed on you, I would patch you up and I'll let you bleed on my cream seats on the way to the airport, airport. On, on the hospital, right? But I'm still gonna risk your arm first before mine. In America, it's the only country that the banks give you money and there is no uh, penal recourse for you not being able to perform. So, if the banks are gonna give me free, unsecured, uncollateralized money to go risk and invest, to go buy my family assets to give me cash flow, I'm gonna risk their money before I risk mine. Wow. Why would you risk your own arm in an investment so that if you lose, you're limbless? Mm -hmm. When the banks are competing against each other to give us cash. Why would the banks give us cash back when we swipe a card? Why do they give us flight points? Because it wants you to keep going. It wants you to keep spending. So I'm gonna give you more cash back than this bank because I, I want you to be my, my customer. Because what, people, what people don't understand, what Dave Ramsey is, isn't telling them, is that when you put your cash in a, in a checking account that gives you 0.001% on a whole year. Mm-hmm. So just so you know, that's 10 cents on 10,000. Mm-hmm. Just so you know, what you mm-hmm. make on 10,000 in the bank. When you do that, the bank then can lend out from a, from a fractional reserve, being fractional banking, they can lend out 10 times that. So when you give the bank 10,000, they can lend out 100,000. Mm-hmm. So they're using your money to 10 times their money to loan you back your own money and charge you for mortgage interest, charge you for business funding, charge you credit card interest, charge you card interest, charge you student loan interest. They're still making back their m- more money. They're making more money off your money and you paying them off your money. Wow. So if they're gonna give me credit, their money, and I can use the credit to go buy assets that pay me at their risk? Wow. You gonna tell me Dave Ramsey's right? <laughs> I gotta ask you another question. <laughs> I gotta ask you about this. Uh, they're doing, not the PP lo- PPI loan, was it? Mm-hmm. What, it was mm-hmm. that, what was that other oh, loan? Lord, e. It, if you're the business, e, e something, e mm-hmm. something. E Y E D or E Y D L or yeah, it's it's a, it's a loan that they're giving small like businesses. A grant. It's like a grant, mm-hmm. and, and they say you don't have to pay, pay it back. Is this something that's real or is this something that that is is, is this a smoking yeah, mirror? Oh, it's real. It's real. Mm-hmm. No risk in it or nothing. And you can get a loan. As long as you was a business owner. Yeah. Really. And have an E I N number yeah. for years. This is what I'm trying to say. That's why, that's, why, that's why I be on the corners teaching with flip charts and go so hard. Yeah. Bro, they're printing the money. So what do they care about giving you the money? They're just printing it. They're just printing it. It's not backed by gold. It's not, they're printing it, man. It's paper. So they can give it up. 
it has extended the debt ceiling to 31.5 trillion. America's gonna be in 31.5 trillion in debt. So Dave Ramsey is telling you, don't get debt. But the greatest country in the world, they call it, is in 31.5 trillion That's of debt. That's the same thing Shamaria says. Yeah, Our daughter, yeah, daughter yeah. said, bro, come on. So, so we should trash the Dave Ramsey books. Bro. Should we trash the Dave Ramsey books? Chew the meat, spit out the bones. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. I'm not saying there's nothing good in there. I've never looked at his books, so I can't tell you that. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm wise enough and mature enough not to make a blanket statement like that. Yeah, and the only reason I said it, because early on, we I remember when we first got married, 20 years ago. Dave you're Ra tripping right now. No, I said Because <laughs> <laughs> you told me you had your house nearly paid off. It yeah. Is. You yeah. are losing money in your house. It's going to pay it off. No, the fact that you got it paid off. What's that doing for you? How are you building wealth from your house being paid off? Not really nothing, huh? Just say your house is worth three hundred thousand. Yeah, four hundred thousand. That money could be, you could borrow eighty percent of that tax free. That's say it's worth four hundred thousand. You borrow eighty percent, that's three hundred twenty thousand, and put that three hundred twenty thousand down as a uh, twenty percent on a new house, on an apartment building, on an apartment mm -hmm. building. That's gonna give you cash flow. Mm -hmm. But you're living in it, feeling good because I got to pay it off. The, the, Dave say you it feel different when you walk on the on the grass. It really don't. Are we dealing <laughs> with feelings here? Or are we dealing with legacy? <laughs> no, you're right. Changing changing the whole generational structure of how your people lived all the, that's big. See, you gotta be uh, emotionally unattached from money and from credit. That's the thing. They play on our emotions when it comes to credit. You are gonna feel better. Yeah, it do feel better when you ain't got no debt. When you attached to the debt. Do you think America feels good with 31.5 trillion of debt? But how are you making money after that? Yes, you paid everything off, but how are you making more money to leave a land That's after real. that? How are you building the wealth? It right. takes money to build wealth. Right. But you're sitting and hoarding all the money. Holding money. So if you're holding the money, how can you sow a seed? <laughs> you gotta sow a seed. <laughs> it's so true, man. God. And but I, you, you feel good holding it, though. I'm telling you what you're saying. It it's, it's real because you got this money I, I struggle with this all the time. I just got a lot of money. Like, okay, what? What? I'm just sitting on money. Bro, it could be making 8 money. Eight percent every year. Inflation's eight percent. So on every hundred thousand, you're losing eight grand every year. You only got ninety two thousand. That's crazy. But you think of this too. I'm coming from a country, Jamaica, who I was raised where if you don't have it, you don't buy it. So we don't have like credit and stuff like that. Is when you come up here, you're like, you That's why all, of this, all of this, <laughs> credit, you do it. No all of this credit, all giving you cash. <laughs> so. I got somebody in my program she got funded 430,000 unsecured. No collateral, no house, no car. She got 430 of the bank's money. And she went and flipped it and, it and the flip didn't go well. The market crashed or whatever. You know what they gonna do? Send her a letter in the mail. Mm. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. I met man. another business person because he would always have mis businesses, right? This was back in the day. He had a shop, and um, I guess the shop, you know, business went bad, the shop closed. He opened up a tire shop somewhere else. I, I ran into him, whatever. He said, different name. He said, oh, yeah, that closed out. All I do is just file bankruptcy and then move on and get this other one. And that's what a lot of people be doing. Listen, it's like, it's such a re education has to go on. Many of the most wealthy people in the world have been through bankruptcy, mm -hmm. have lost on businesses. The richest hedge, the richest hedge fund manager, Ray Dalio, the richest of all hedge fund managers, the biggest hedge fund in the whole world. He literally, back in the eighties, when he started his company, had made some mistakes, lost everything, was borrowing four thousand from his dad to pay for his rent and mortgage and all of that, and built that up to the largest hedge fund in the world. Wow. Most of us are just tap out. Oh, it didn't work. Oh my God, because you're so emotional. You gotta get out your way, bro. It's not about get out this. your own way. So we think that there's there's job security and and I can hold on to the money and I'm just that's that's not how wealth is built. It's actually built on risk. Think about this: the banks in the business of selling money. That's all they do. They sell money. The bank doesn't like. They don't sell assets or properties. They sell money. If the bank in the business of selling money, I want to be in the money, business of selling money too. That's real. I like it. And I'm going to use their money to go make my money at their risk. Is there a lot of people that call on you? Like, I, I know a lot of entertainers. A lot of people call on you for financial guidance. They do. Man. And, and, um, and you don't have to say a name, which is private, but like, 
Um, what's one of the biggest things that you've done to help somebody that had money to, to, to accumulate, you know, more money? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I've given a lot of like, I held a mansion mastermind with like uh, Kerry Hilson, B. Simone, Jalen Collins, NFL player, and a couple other people in our network, my, my wife's network, Ernestine Morrison. Yeah. Um, and that was pretty cool. I got the breakdown. It's just like, I'm not a know-it-all, I just know a lot. Oh, people and think I, you know it all. And I've experienced <laughs> a lot. But that also creates that that, that complex, because like, who yeah, do you think he is? Yeah, yeah. Right, so like, people like be like, quick to want to burst my bubble or say he's this or he's that, because it's like, I come together to package like oh he want to be all six three and two twenty and handsome and smart and shit like some guy be going on with him some guy be some guy be going on you want to be passing he's a life beater yeah you want to be passing SEC and FBI <laughs> test and you want to be all clean and stuff he like, paid them off yes yeah, all like, of that sort of stuff it's called God's grace family wow <laughs> and, and, and it sounds so cliche but it's, it, it's I'm favored and I and I, I love it. But I, we can understand that because a lot of people ask us, you know, how y'all been married 20 years? And the first thing that can come up to, out of our mouth is God. That's all it is. That's it. it what I, mean, God. Saying, I didn't survive all my stuff on my own. I know this. Yeah. So I'll give credit. So you won't be mad at me. Be mad at my God. That's real. My God greater than my enemies. I mean, when did you tap so into your spirituality? Mm -hmm. And it's, this will be, we'll wrap it's, it up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always been there and always been lurking. Um, after this last storm, man, when like, yo, it's like the whole world was against us. It was like, yo, it was weird because I was like, I was the GOAT. It was like, you couldn't say nothing bad about Jay Morrison. Uh, 66 corner classes. I'm teaching on Murder Mac and Bewick in East Detroit. I'm like all in the hoods. I'm everywhere with conferences, this and the third. And, and a lot then, of people turn their backs on you? Man. But it showed 90%. you who your true friends are too. Yeah. And so when that happened, and I also had a uh, diverticulitis at the time. I had what is that for people who don't know? Hole in my intestine. Mm -hmm. And I had a poop bag, colostomy mm -hmm. bag. And my wife was pregnant, and then our daughter had surgeries, um, and so much was going on. And I just went, watched me go from like Mr. Untouchable to like sneers, jickers, shame, all that. And um, I, man, I was, I was broken to your point. I, I, was, I, was, I was near broken. And um, I got with a spiritual mentor, Bishop Dean, and um, referred by some po uh, some folks, and just started diving in. And like my relationship with God was kind of sketchy. Like I believed in God, but it was like I had church hurt, I had church mm -hmm. hurt, and like religion hurt, mm -hmm. and it was affecting my relationship. But as I and your wife was the same way as well. Now she was actually more spiritual relationship at that time. I was still like more in between, like okay. where I wanted to go. But um, as I dove into the Word, man, and it all just started connecting, and then I started tithing again. And mm -hmm. I even did a back tie for like ties I owed. Mm -hmm. And like just got back in covenant and I just started watching doors unlock and just blessings. I just watched my peace increase. And it was a process, a very long process. But as I matured in it, um, I got a book that's going to be dropping soon. I got a book called My God is Greater Than My Enemies. Wow. And uh, I tell some of this testimony. So I'm going to save some for the book. But God has done some stuff for me. I've documented that I can literally prove. That my God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. Jacob, Jacob, Joseph, mm -hmm. he's thousand percent real it's not the universe it's not energy i'm telling you i got documented proof that i can prove it not even three thousand years ago 2023 today i got documented proof that my god is real and greater than my enemies documented mm -hmm. proof so the way that he redeemed me and restored my family and and his word didn't come back void and in isaiah 61 7 it says um instead of shame i will give you a double portion mm -hmm. instead of disgrace you're rejoicing your inheritance so you receive a double portion of your land and everlasting joy will be yours. And man, he tried to shame me, he tried to shame me, he tried to heckle me, he tried to all that. And it's like, man, um, God is just like a, a blessing us with such abundance and, and he's just showing himself through us. And um, I just know in this season and this posture and with this conviction, like we can't lose. Like God gonna bless his own work. So he's gonna underwrite his own work. Wow, so it's like, but you know, there's always gonna be trial and tribulation in life as long as we live here on this earth because our lives are a testament to others. It's not really for ourselves. Facts. So um, I, one thing I always tell everybody, I said, if Job, if he can do what he did to Job, and that was God who allowed the devil to tempt him, because devil actually went and asked for permission yeah. to tempt him to do to put him through all yeah. the things that he put I'm him through. Job right now, you see what I mean? <laughs> so I tell everybody, I said, when you're going through situations, read Job because if he can go through all of that. Yeah. yeah, you can you, do it. I know we're gonna wrap. I want to say this. You know what changed it for me too? January 2022, my spirit 
uh, told me, and God shared with me, to read the Bible in chronological order for myself. Okay. So I started at Genesis 1-1, and I just mm -hmm. started reading. And when you start seeing about all the mighty men and women of God and what they went through and all their journeys and their tests and King Saul and King David and people we never even heard of before. You ain't even heard about the church before. Like they like quiet, <coughs> quiet heroes. Yeah, Nehemiah, yeah. Obadiah. Yeah, all types of Habakkuk. other ones. Yeah, you yeah the ones that nobody yeah. mentioned, the miners. You just start seeing like, man, you start seeing it and relating to your life and, um, you know, it's definitely real. So, uh, you know, just that, 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 that journey has said so much and there's been other times in my life where God has showed up and I've watched what's happened when I've been disobedient versus being obedient. And, um, you know, so man, I'm, just, you, I'm just walking you in You live, man. In yeah. I like you. Thank you. Thank bro. you, man. Like you, you, you dope. Hey, love you, bro. Man. Yeah, I love you, man. Like, I just, I, like, it's it's crazy. Like, you know, you know, like, I could tell on you that you had a great spirit, man. I don't go by what people say. No way. It's hard for me to deal with people. I have to meet. I, I be like, man, you know what, man? They do. You can't play with God. That's the thing. I know that. You can't you you play with everything else, but when it comes to God, you ain't just, no ain't no plan. It, you, you it's gonna hit you, and you got you got to tell somebody. That's the main thing too. A lot of people won't get behind these mics and even speak on God mm -hmm. because they just wait till they may get a award or something yeah. like that. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. when you talk about it and you've been through the when you've been through the storm, yeah. that's when it starts to come out and it just starts to flow with your life. Yeah, and everybody will understand, and you know what? I understand why they don't understand. <laughs> it's not for them to understand. You That's see real. so many, you see so many people in the Bible where God shut their ears, shut their eyes, where they couldn't understand. You had some disciples who was walking with Christ and saw all of the different miracles, but then still questioned Him. I understand why they don't understand, Queen. So. That's real. So That's I used real. I used to be in this thing where I had to be like so defensive, and it's like, how could y'all be saying this about me? Like y'all don't like, you know me. I poured my heart out. Like yo, I was at the Alpha Right protest and the Freddie Gray protest, and like I let us hear, and I was on CNN and on Fox News, and I da, da, da. like look at all my fruit, and I mentor young boys for three years, and I could go down a whole list of my fruit, but it's like yo, if you're not meant to understand or want to understand, you ain't gonna never understand. Wow. But the lesson is for you to see that not everybody who is around you is for you. Man. That's true. And one of my largest lessons, because I was such an activist and I was so into black power, my, my, my biggest thing is black power ain't enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, I gotta wrap this up. Yeah, it's man, I, I can keep this going up. forever, yeah, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you just, coming to Dallas soon. You gotta come to Dallas. So when you come, Dallas. So when you come to Dallas, Dallas. Dallas. you coming to so my when store. We gonna do this again because our yeah, people can learn from this, man. You still have more stories, and we have questions, and you never know. We might even do like a Q and A. I might find a couple people who are like not very literate where finance and yeah. stuff is concerned. Just to have somebody on, so people can see, man. I think it's levels to it, man. And you really, you, I know from what I've seen and what I he see here today you've helped so many people man and just so. meeting the lady like we did on the elevator that was crazy but at any rate man keep doing what you're doing man yes, sir. we love you bro let Jay. me tell oh I'm sorry about where they can find it credit to cash flow that's dot right pro right you can use number two credit to cash flow dot pro that's our private mentorship program currently 90% off for annual mentorship you get weekly lessons weekly calls with me and my partner you get over 150 lessons six curriculums PDFs textbooks ebooks private banks funding credit repair all that all rolled in one credit to cash flow dot pro and you can follow me on Instagram IG TikTok YouTube at Mr. J Morrison and Jay is a, a, a firm believer in boss talk 101 and what we do now you come to Dallas this guy is rocking with us man he's a podcast king he loves podcasting and helping people and being be informed about how to change their wealth you know generational wealth is real health is wealth so man just thank you you look good you look great thank keep you. doing Appreciate your thing man thank you for your energy and your invite thank man you. it's been another great segment of boss talk 101 what a boss is talk and we out